Well, welcome to Navigation Church. We are at week number two at something called the Armor of God. How many have ever heard the phrase the Armor of God before? That's one of those, that's one of those common things you've probably heard in church before. If not, don't worry about it. I'll explain everything in just a moment to you. First thing I want to do is if you're watching online, we are thrilled that you're tuning in. We know that every single week more and more of you are watching us, and I'm glad that you feel part of the ministry. I want you to know that whatever we are experiencing here, you can experience there, except for one thing, community. So if you're ever in the council area and would like to stop by, we'd love to meet you face to face. For everyone else, we're going to talk about the full armor of God. In order to do that, we're on week number two, and we're going to talk about the breastplate of righteousness. Last week, we talked about the belt of truth, and I'll review that. But before I go to review that, I wanted, when I was getting ready to write the sermon, and I, it was basically talking about clothing, I had a flashback to two of the maybe... Uh, humbling, I'll use that phrase, maybe more humbling experiences I've ever had when it comes to clothes shopping. How many have ever heard of the brand Diesel before? Okay, if you haven't raised your hand, don't feel bad. You can't afford it and neither could I. But for some reason, I've always wanted a brand of diesel jeans. So we're at a place where there was an outlet mall and I remember walking in and picking up the first price tag and going, is there supposed to be a comma in that? <laughs> like, <laughs> it's supposed to be just some denim that I'm throwing on. And I just remember it being very expensive. So I went to something called the sales rack. How many does that when you go shopping? I'll give you some insight, okay? You can buy stuff that's in style, or you can wait six months that it's out of style and it's on the sales rack. And everyone who sees you in it don't know if you bought it today or six months ago. So be cheap like me, go to the sales rack. So so I'm in this sales rack and I'm looking through and this guy comes up to me and goes, hey, is there something I can maybe help you with? And I said, yeah, I'm looking for a pair of jeans. He asked me what size I was and I'm like, well, you know, 28 <laughs> length. Um, yeah. Numbers don't matter. Stop judging. So I told him what the numbers was and there's like walls of jeans and I swear, this is how awkward it was. No. He goes, you might find something over there. I don't like your brand of jeans anyway. Overpriced. So I left. And, and another time I went shopping with my wife. And uh, I don't want to tell you the name of the store because of the, the way that I was treated. But I'll get to that. Um, I went to, once again, the sales rack. And we found a pair of jeans for like 10 bucks. I'm like, done. Like, as long as they fit, these are coming home. Even if they don't fit, you can do that stretchy thing, you know. <laughs> It feels like more women were laughing at that than men, so maybe I shouldn't know that. And so I put these jeans on, and they were known as skinny jeans. Have you ever heard of that before? Literally, the waist had trouble getting over my ankles. <laughs> but for 10 bucks, I'm putting these suckers on. So I come out of the changing room with my new jeans on, and my wife is looking at me trying to figure out how to say something to me. And the saleswoman looks at me and goes, well, those are made for a certain body type. Literally, that's all she said. So you know what I did? I did a Hindu squat, blew out the crotch, and I gave him back to him. No, no. <laughs> Probably could have happened in these jeans. So, so here's, what, here's why I tell that. We're talking about the full armor of God. And when I tell you about the full armor of God, this is actually God's armor. So number one, you should not be able to afford it. And number two, there's no way the almighty, uh, omniscient, omnipotent God of the universe, you should be able to wear it. But I have great news for you. The price tag has been paid for, and it's a one-size-fit-all. And here's the other thing. If you're like, well, the armor's kind of chafing me. It's rubbing on me. Um, you're wearing it wrong. Like, if you're like, man, this belt of truth is too tight. Oh, you're a little too loose. Oh, I didn't mean it like. <laughs> Apparently, I'm not allowed to say it like that. <laughs> Well, what do you think about the breastplate? No way. I'm making jokes on that one. So <laughs> at some point, if the armor's not fitting you right, it's chances are you're not wearing it right. But our God of the universe has armor for you. And by the way, when I say God of the universe has armor for you, so the Apostle Paul is sitting down. He's, act, he's in prison, actually writing this letter to the church of Ephesus. And in writing it, he's been explaining in chapter 1 through 3, we're part, we, we've become followers of Christ. We're part of a different kingdom. And then chapters 4, 5, and 6... Now that you're living in this new kingdom of God, here's how you act. You need 
need to not be a liar. You need to tell truth. You don't be, don't be, uh, don't consume, be generous, you know? And so, so he's explaining all this. And then he gets to the final part in chapter six. And he goes, by the way, now that you're on team Jesus and you're not on team Satan, there's a chance your faith is going to come under attack. But you need to put on the full armor of God so that you can fight to defend your faith. And by the way, here's what this armor looks like. And he starts rattling off this really cool imagery that he stole from the prophet Isaiah. Bet you didn't know that. He's a plagiarist. I'll say it out loud. He didn't give any credit for it. So, but here's the apostle Paul knew what the uh, prophet Isaiah. And by the way, here's your quick Bible lesson of the day. If, if you want to just know more about the Bible, there's two types of prophets in the Old Testament. Major prophets and minor prophets. And here's how you can tell them apart. You may need to write this down. This is so difficult to remember. Okay. Major prophets have big books. Minor prophets have small books. That is true, by the way. That major prophets, minor prophets. And Isaiah was a major prophet. And you've heard about him even if you don't know you've heard about him. Because at Christmas time, when you hear about a son that was born to us, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and he'll be known as wonderful and counselor and God, that's Isaiah. Our songs are quoting Isaiah. If you've ever at Christmas time heard that we'd have a son born unto a virgin, that's Isaiah. At Easter time, if you ever heard that by his stripes we're healed, bruised for our iniquity, everyone's just stealing from Isaiah, quoting him, but they're not stealing from him. Isaiah was standing years ago going, heads up, here's what you have coming your way. And by the way, you're eventually going to have a king come your way. And you'll know who this king is because he's going to have a belt of truth. He's going to have a breastplate of righteousness. He's going to have a sword. So Isaiah 11, 5, 49, 2, 54, 17 are all the different places that you see that we're going to have this God type armor. So by the way, you are actually getting to wear the armor of God, your coming king. This is fascinating thought. And so here's what the first step you do is you put on the belt of truth. Truth. There is such thing as absolute truth. We believe it's located in the word of God. This word of God is external to mankind so that we can't manipulate it. We merely live our life off of it. Then the next thing is we need to have righteousness. How many feel like righteousness is a very churchy word? Doesn't that feel churchy? Okay, so let's just change it right now because here's what we're going to say. Righteousness is right living. Ta-da! If you don't have righteousness, you have wrong in this. We're going with it. Okay, so, so here's what I would say. Righteousness is the standard God requires for people to become acceptable to him. Because he has his truth out there and we're supposed to be living up to the standard of his truth. If we're living up to that standard, we're right living. So if truth, the belt of truth, is the informational base that tells me the right thing to do, then righteousness is the application of that truth in my everyday life. Okay, so truth is the head knowledge that there's something out there that I should be acting like. But just because I know that I should be saving money every week, just because I know I should be eating healthy, just because I know I should love on my wife versus hating on my wife, just because I know that doesn't mean I actually am applying those truths to my life. Can anyone with a gym membership that hasn't been there since February say amen? Amen. Right, because come January, you are going to be this health nut and you downloaded the keto diet. And the next thing you know, you're going to be God's gift to... Uh, I, I, no workout person came to mind right there. So Arnold Schwarzenegger, it, that tells you how old I am. So it, like, you're, like you're ready to get your pump on, you get your sweat on, you're going to lose weight. You did all this because you knew there's a right way to live. Because if you live correctly with exercise in your life, what will happen? Your heart will start pumping. And if your heart and your chest is pumping correctly, the rest of you live. But if the heart in your chest isn't pumping correctly, guess what? You die. Very same principle is true in your spirit life. If your spiritual heart is pumping correctly, then you live. But if your spiritual heart isn't pumping correctly, the rest of your spiritual life will die. And so when it comes to truth and the breastplate of righteousness is because you need to properly apply the truth into your life. And by applying it into your life, now you are right living. Right living, another way to say it is you're righteous. But the reason the breastplate has to hang here, because the breastplate protects the most important part of us, is our heart. Without our heart, we don't live. There's, you know, there's actually aspects of your body that if it goes wrong, they can just pull parts out. 
I don't think they can just pull your heart out and say, hey, come back next week for a checkup. It's, it has to be a heart transplant. There always has to be a heart at the core of who we are. And so when it comes to rightness, right living, truth is what God says about something. Righteousness is my response to that truth. Truth is how, what God says about something. Righteousness, right living is how I respond to that truth. Because there's a lot of places in my life I know what truth is. But it doesn't mean I'm living right in all those places. Can anyone say amen so I don't feel like I'm alone at that? Amen. That you know how to act better than you sometimes act. Because you know the truth, but you haven't properly aligned it. So, so when I started looking at this, I'm going, okay, so when it comes to the breastplate, we could, talk about, uh, we could talk about what that looked like and the armies that had it and things like that. But, but honestly, I can't get away from the thought about the heart. So I asked this question. I go, how do we protect our heart then? And I was reading a book called Psalms, Psalms 119. If you don't know what Psalms this is, honestly, open up to Psalms and it'll probably fall to 119 because it's like 49,000 pages long. It's the longest Psalms in the world. So, so it, Psalms 119, if you're reading through this, there's actually, I believe, the understanding of what the heart is, but then three key steps in order to protect your heart. So I provided the scripture on the screen. We're going to do Psalms 119, 112 through 114. You may, you may want to write this down because this, this might need to become a life verse for someone. And it says this, my heart is set on keeping your decrees to the very end. Let's just stop there for a second. So another translation of the Bible actually says this, I incline my heart to follow your laws. So my heart is wanting to choose truth. So I'm going to incline myself to it. If I have to incline myself to it, there's a chance I naturally decline away from it. Is it easier not to do things or to do things? Is it easier to stay how you've always been or change to what you want to become? Is it easier to default to laziness or push forward with fire and passion? Is it easier to tell God that I'm going to start praying every single morning for 15 minutes and you go to bed that night with full dedication that you're going to pray every morning for 15 minutes and then the next morning you wake up and someone did something horrible. They came in and they put a 200 pound blanket on you and you can't escape. And so your prayer sounds something like this, God, I repent because I ain't praying this morning. Right? Like, it, w we know this, we have this in our head, but it's easier to decline back to what we've always done versus incline forward to what our, what our heart's calling us to. So when it comes to protecting your heart, the first decision we have to make is we're going to choose to lean towards healthy things. And I know, that, doesn't that sound like, well, yeah, but how many of us go, but in this area, I know I'm choosing towards unhealthy in this one area, I always seem to fall back to defeat, abuse. In this one area, I got to be honest, it's just too hard to change. I'd rather stay like this. But what the word here is telling us is that we actually need to incline. Well, you need to make a conscious decision to change not just your behavior, but your beliefs. Because the reality is you can change your behaviors all you want, but if you never change your beliefs, you'll eventually do the behaviors you never wanted. If you do not choose to change your belief systems, your behaviors are the byproduct of what you believe inside of you. You, you, know, you know why? Because I really did like those genes, but I didn't love them enough to change my diet to fit in them. I, my behavior said I'm fine with the size bigger. And when I say size bigger, it could have been four size, but you know, we're, that's tit for tat. But like, if you don't change who you are on the inside, who you are on the inside will always manifest on the outside. So if you want to begin changing your behaviors to something that is constructive and not destructive, the very first thing you have to look at is you have to look at where your heart is inclined to and isn't inclined to the word of God. And, and, and by the way, there's a couple very key steps in order to get to that. And we see that in first, uh, Psalms 19, 119. The very next scripture says this then. I hate double-minded people, but I love your law. So ready for this? I'm going to need an amen. You're going to want to. Hey, Christians, it's time to hate. Chickens. <laughs> 
I told you you're going to need an amen. Let me say it a different way. Hey, Christians, we should hate racism. Okay. Oh, so it is okay to hate. Because one amen ago, you left me up here by myself, not amening me, even though I gave you a heads up that you were going to need to amen me. But let's be honest, you don't really come to church to hear the phrase, hey, Christians, it's time for us to hate. But I have a little insight for you. Hate is a powerful motivator to change. If you hate something enough, you will walk away from it forever because you hate the way it makes you feel. It hates what it does to your relationships. You hate the debt that you're carrying. You hate the feeling. You hate not being able to sleep at night. When you hate something correctly, it will be a driving, motivating force in your life in order to change. But the problem is most of the times we would rather just kind of have behavior modifications. We'd rather manage our trash versus taking out our trash. You know what this looks like. You have people coming over to your house and your house is filthy. Do you take time to put everything away or do you have the one closet you shove everything in? We manage it. That's called religion. A faith in Jesus Christ, we take out the trash. Because you know what happens when you keep putting trash in the back rooms long enough? It still attracts rodents. It still draws in the bugs. And you can spray for them all you want. doesn't mean you're getting rid of them. Why? Because in the deep parts of who you are, you're actually attracting those type of things. But when you get to the point where you hate the smell and you hate the garbage and you hate the rodents, but the problem is some of it works so well for you. Like anger. Anger's fantastic. It's such a good emotion to use. I mean, because instead of you controlling your mouth, you just get to blurt out. Right? You don't have to think through what it's going to do to wound the other person. You just get to feel good for who you are. So you just blurt out in anger. And actually, if you stay angry long enough to that person consistently enough, you can usually break them into your will. Anger's fantastic. Until you find out that you have no one who wants to be around you at the end. Why? Because at some point, this is abuse that no one wants. And when you get to the point where you go, I hate when I act like this. I hate when I talk like this. I hate what it does to the people around me. I hate the conflicts that I always seem to be in. Guess what? That can be a, 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 an absolutely motivating factor for you to begin loving different. You know, you know what I hate? And I, I mean, I hate gossip. I can't stand it. If you feel like gossiping, don't come to me. Um, if you, if you um, don't think you gossip, just everyone loves to come tell you what's going on in their world. You are the problem. And guess what? There's a big enough crowd. I'm allowed to say carte blanche, things like this. I'm not going to get in trouble, right? And so, so if you go, hey, I don't gossip. There just always seems to be drama in my world. You're a gossiper. And here's the thing about gossip that I've learned over time, that if I'm got willing to gossip with you, I will be willing to gossip about you. And the number one thing that erodes trust in a relationship is not feeling like the person has your back. I hate gossip. I hate it because as a church, as followers of Jesus Christ, I need anyone at any time to feel like they're able to come to me and go, I have to talk. And if you gossip, it's about getting the juicy details to share someone else. I hate that. Here's what I want. I want you to know that when you come to me, it's just the two of us. And I have you. It is so easy for me not to gossip because I love enough on the other side. But if we don't get to a place in our life where you don't hate the right things, guess what? You will have a heart attack, naturally speaking, spiritually speaking. Why? Because you're carrying burdens, you're, you're beating for things that you shouldn't beat about. So incline yourself to God's law so that you're not double-minded. Put yourself in a position where I'm focusing on that. In any place where my life doesn't line up with this word, I'm going to choose, incline myself. And guess what? It's going to be hard, to, but I learned the truth. In order for me to protect this truth, I have to put on this breastplate of right living righteousness. So the first thing I want to say, in order to protect your heart, you need to hate correctly. Can you hear what I'm saying there? Okay, if any of you go out and start spray painting and burning down buildings, you really miss that point. <laughs> Next verse says this, I hate double-minded people, but I love your law. You are my refuge and my shield. You need to find the place to hide. But the problem is most of us, when it comes to when our hearts start hurting, we run to the wrong thing. 
Because guess what? This, this is true. Uh, if it's eating habits, spending habits, whatever it might be, just because it feels right doesn't mean it has long-term positive benefits. Because when I'm down and I get me a Suzy Q, how many know what Suzy Qs are? Like, it's not my birthday, but it could be next week if you want to bring me a box of these. And, and I'll teach you how to eat them correctly. You take two, take the top off one and scrape it. Take the top off the other one, scrape it, because that's the thicker, and you get the two bottoms together, and it's like a quad stuff. It's just amazing grace. I mean, it's fantastic. And it has such positive effects on my temporary relief, but 20 minutes later, when I'm sweating and crashing because of sugar, it had no long-term good effects on me. And the same thing that happens to the places that we run to, we run to a, a relationship that you shouldn't. You run to addiction that's killing you. You run to numbingness if it's TV, uh, uh, um, 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 recreational things. We run to all these things because we're trying to find shelter. Because can I tell you this? No one wants to hurt. We want to avoid that pain. We want to avoid that feeling. So what we do is we run to these places to find temporary relief, but unless, and by the way, this is going to be a great amen time, unless we find our refuge in God, it will only be temporary satisfactions. Unless you run to the people of God that can turn and point you to God, it will only be temporary satisfactions. But all of us know, need to know this, that we have places in our, our life that we run and hide to that will not do us good long term. So currently I'm uh, in a program called the 110. I'm going to use the phrase, it's a discipleship program. It's a self-help program that helps other people. And in it, it helps me prioritize my life. What are some of the goals I want to get to, but also some of the strategic steps to get there. And, but then every day I watch a, about a 10 minute video, just to kind of get my mind set on that day. And for one of the weeks, we looked at how I, how we as individuals have superpowers so for instance, if I'm focused enough on the future I want to get to, I have supervision. And so it's just some neat analogies like that that we're walking through. And one of the ones that as we were talking, the question came, if you're a superhero, who's your supervillain? You know, and there's, by the way, there's just shortcomings in my life. I know about those, but I really started thinking about what is my supervillain? What is the one thing? What is the superpower the supervillain has in my life? And actually, I named him Captain Invisible. Because I have an amazing job to be able to disappear to the world around me. When I'm hurting, when things just don't seem like they're going well, this may sound weird to you. There's times where there's success, and I go, man, at some point everyone's going to find out I'm a fraud. Like, I'm not qualified to do this. I'm not good enough to do this. And, and so here's what I do. I go to my superpower of invisibility, and I disappear. And actually, it's crazy. I can be in plain sight. And we can be having a conversation. And I can put my fake face on. But then there are other times where I disappear at the house. I disappear from family and the kids. I, I disappear because guess what? I'm thinking if I move myself away from the pain enough, then I won't have to focus on it. But then the craziest things happen. The thoughts go with me. Like, no, no, I, I'm running away from you. I don't need you to repeat in my ears what I already know I need to run away from. But guess what? I'm not running to the right place. I'm running to any place. So then I put on my cloak of invisibility. I put in my, my, my cave of abandonment. I put, get to all by myself. And the only thing I hear is, see, you even know you need to get away. And we believe these lies. And it's because we don't have someone speaking the truth to us. What truth? The truth that's outside of us. But if I'm always running this way towards the enemy, how can God promise to protect me when they're my sense of relief? He will be my protector and he'll be my shield. He'll be my sword. But guess what? I need to come to him. And I need to know that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I don't have to fear evil. He's got this staff. He'll protect me and he'll guide me. I have to know that every weapon formed against me will not prosper. But let's be honest, you feel like you have a bunch of knives in your back and you're going, man, that feels like it's prospering. But the truth says, hey, on, it may wound you, 
but it's not going to kill you. There's something about finding our shelter in the right place that protects our heart. Does that make sense? If I ask you right now, pull out a piece of paper, here, turn to the person you don't know next to them and tell them your place. First of all, how many would not want to do that exercise? Good, all of us. Okay. But how many would have something to say? Yeah, this is what I do. This is where I run. But then the final part of the scripture is absolutely beautiful. It says this, you are my refuge and my shield. I put my hope in your word. Last night, today, I've been praying over this word, hope. Because faith is the substance of things hoped for. When it comes to your life, you have to have hope for tomorrow. You have to have hope for your marriage and your relationship. You have to have hope that you can get free from this addiction. You have to have hope that you can get that college degree. You have to have hope that you're following God's destiny. You have to have hope for your children. You have to have hope. Without hope, you die. And in order to get hope, you need to meditate on God's word. So, so far today, you've had a pastor tell you you need to meditate and you need to hate. I think I proved the hate one. Let me talk about the meditating one because meditating isn't some Eastern mysticism that's, that, that Christians shouldn't be doing. Meditate is something you do already, but usually it's in the negative form. It's called worry. If you worry, you practice meditation in the negative format because what do you do? There's a problem out there. There's a bill out there. There's a decision out there. There's something out there. And all you do is you think about it, right? You dwell on it. You rehearse it. You look at it from every single angle. You find other people to validate how bad that thing is and what happens in your life. You begin to stress. You begin to shake. And your heart is at peace. Nope. Your heart hurts. You have trouble sleeping at night. Your blood pressure goes up. So wait a second, if I meditate on something in the negative, what happens if I meditate on something towards the positive? Probably instead of worry, I have hope. Rather than feeling defeated, I feel like a conqueror. And so the place is in your life, because number the, one of the things that you end up doing to protect your heart I hate that thing so much. I'm going to run to God. And while I'm sitting with God, I'm going to talk to him about the truth. And when you start focusing on the places in your life that you need hope for, when you start understanding what God says about that thing and you, when you start delving into the truth of what you've been called to as an individual, as a Christian, as a follower of Christ, guess what? Something starts rising up inside of you and it's hope. And your natural heart, you have hope that you're exercising and you're running, you're eating healthy. You don't have the stress and it's pumping blood through your body and you're feeling alive. Same thing happens spiritually when you start focusing on who God is and what he says about you. And do you know this? You are more than a conqueror. Are you feeling beat today? I need to tell you to focus on the other thing. You are not tapped out. You're not down for the 10 count. You're not knocked out. You are more than a conqueror. Let your hope rise again. You're the head and not the tail. You're above and not beneath. You're a son and a daughter of God. When we start focusing on these other things, guess what? We choose to incline our life to the truth about who God is and inclining our life. There's, by the way, inclining our life. Like, you always have to do it. I'd love to say, I went to church January 1st. I'm good for the year. No, I have to keep inclining myself to that. I went to the gym twice this year. I've inclined myself to exercise. Till next week, incline yourself. I put something in the savings account in January. Don't you get paid every two weeks? Every two weeks, incline yourself, incline yourself, incline yourself. Invest, invest in stuff. You know, I actually, so annoyed. My wife was mad that I've only told her I love you once this year. Like, well, I told you. Isn't that good enough? No, I'm pretty sure I need to incline hourly to telling her you're beautiful. I, I married up, whatever that phrase means. You know, I get... I get I have to incline myself to have a healthy relationship with my wife. Yesterday, she was just kind of getting ready, and I looked at her, and I said, can I ask you one question? We weren't fighting. Everything was good. I said, what is one place in my life that I do that when I do this thing, it puts a wall up between us? 
Any of you guys have guts to go home and do that? But here's what I did. I was doing preventative marriage maintenance. I was trying to incline myself towards her. What is the one thing that I do that puts a wall up? Because guess what? If it's stealing the pillows at night, I mean, we'll buy more pillows. I'm not giving mine up. I got, <laughs> you ain't got eight pillows. You ain't got a good night's sleep. So like, like we'll figure out an answer, not necessarily her solution. But like, if there's, if there's one thing that I do all the time, wouldn't that be easy for me to change? Why? Because I've inclined for my heart to know the same thing about God. On a regular basis, we need to incline our heart. And any place that it's not lined up to the word of God, we need to begin to hate in a righteous way, a right living way. And when those things come up, we need to find ourselves hiding in his refuge. And while there, no matter what the beliefs would say, no matter what your mind would rehearse, no matter what enemy is echoing in your ears, you need to stay there and find hope in what truth is all about. If you're here today, and you think, I don't have hope. Hope for your future. Hope for your family. If there's one area that you would go, right now, I feel defeated in that. You, could I just pray for you just for a second? If you want to, again, bow your heads, close your eyes. If you're watching online, same prayer for you. I just pray, pray for any place that you are feeling defeated. I pray for hope to come in right now. I pray that a word that I've said is something for you to hold on to. I pray that a relationship that you're in, that they give you godly counsel that you've never heard before. I pray that you open up the book and see something you've never seen before and you're able to grab hold of that hope and you have life and life abundant because of it. I pray for anybody in here right now that you continue to run to destructive patterns if you continue to run to places where the enemy is seated versus your God standing for you, I pray that you find a new place to run, new patterns to start developing. And that not just to be a behavior, but it become a belief because inside of us, we hate this thing so much that we have to run to the right place. Because today, I pray none of you have a heart attack. I pray that your spiritual life beats the way that it's supposed to and it energizes your life the way you've been called to. If you don't mind, just two more minutes. Keep your eyes closed and your head bowed. The greatest hope that we can have is in a man named Jesus Christ who died for our sins. We were here because of a man named Jesus Christ. This church exists, churches around the world, all because of one man, Jesus Christ. The entire Bible is written about one man, Jesus Christ. And here's what he did for you. When there was no hope for humanity, he stepped out of heaven onto earth and hung himself on a cross for you. The Romans didn't do it. The Christians didn't do it. It was his love that did it. And upon being nailed to that cross, he died for you. A lot of people have died on a cross, but only one man three days later came back to prove his claims that he was God. If you're here today and you are so tired of the armor that you carry around, it's dinged, it's scarred, it's pierced. You never feel like you're winning battles, let alone losing a war. You're ready to take that armor off and get a new armor of God. The simple question is this, are you ready to make Jesus Lord of your life? If that is you today, eyes are closed, heads are bowed. If that's you today, could you just simply raise your hand just so that I can see that you've made that decision? I see those hands in the center. I see those hands in the back. I see these hands up front. Amen. I see those hands. Today is a day that you change into your new armor. And since there were so many hands that went up, could we all say this prayer today? Dear Jesus, I find refuge in you. I want to be focused on you. And to do that, I lay down my weapons and I pick up your armor. Become Lord of my life. Forgive me of my sins. And this day forward, I passionately pursue you and your truth. Dear God, I just thank you for lives that are changed here today. I pray for the hopeless to become hopeful. I pray for those that feel abandoned, they find refuge in you. And God, above all things, anything that would come contrary to what your word is calling us, Lord, let us handle it appropriately. 
Let us cast it off of our life so we can find the freedom you've called us to. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen.